good singing this morning. You may be seated. Hand at the Truth for Youth rally yesterday. Our children, our young children, our teens. They don't want. They don't want to go back to children. Uh, teens did get um, third place, so that was that was good, and they did they did well. And there were several questions that they just about answered, but uh, they had to buzz in quick enough, and they answered the question technically correctly, but they didn't hear the whole of the question, and so they missed it because there was a little bit more of the question that. They had to answer, but if you don't buzz in quick, you don't get it. So um, it's uh, it. But it, they did they did good and studied well. You could tell that they studied well. We were glad about that. Turn with me to Titus chapter three. Remember, we're looking at uh, just some messages on dealing with our inner self, and I want to look today at the idea of hate and what uh, place it has or doesn't have in our lives. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if on the inside you have hatred toward people, the Bible speaks pretty strongly about that, and we want to deal with that this morning. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 5 says this, For we ourselves also were sometimes. And he's talking about people that are saved, and he's saying this is what we were. Every time in the Bible you see someone getting saved, their life changes. That does not mean that everything, that they completely stop sinning. Uh, but it means that they're changed from the inside out, and they have now a desire to live for and serve God. And as God brings to mind, and as they read the Bible, there are things that need to change. They're willing to change those things. They are not the same person they were before. And so the Bible says, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And so you see that phrase there, a lot of unsaved people live in these things. Now, not everybody all the time. It says we also were sometimes foolish. Every unsaved person is not 100% of the time doing foolish things. Every unsaved person is not 100% of the time hating people. But there is a lot of hate when there's not the love of God in a person. But it says this, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If you'll take and just think about that passage, this is who we were. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving all kinds of lusts, diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And then we learned about God's love and kindness toward us. We learned about Jesus Christ dying for us. And we get saved not by transforming ourselves. We get saved by turning to Jesus and realize he's the only one that can save me. And we put our complete trust, faith, and belief in him. He's the Savior. And then Jesus changes us. And all of those things are now a were, whereas they, it was a present thing. Now it's, that's past. My life has changed. And so as we think about that, one of those things that was there, hateful and hating one another is something that should be changed when you trust Jesus Christ as Savior. So let's take and pray, and we'll uh, take the message today. Father, I, I ask that you would help us. I know that we live in a hate-filled society. I know that as we read through the Bible, there are examples of hate all through the Word of God. I pray that you would help us as born-again believers, that we would live in the love of Christ. Father, I ask that if there's someone here not yet saved, God, we don't want to just assume that every person is saved. God, I pray that maybe today would be the day that they would put their faith and trust in you and repent of sin 
and follow uh, you as Savior. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. First of all, what is hate? Hate is dislike, but it's a great dislike. It's to have an aversion to. I hope that there is no one in your life that you look at and you have an aversion to that person. You absolutely hate that person. We may hate things that people do, uh, but to to hate a person, Jesus uh, died for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves sinners. Let me show you in the beginning, there are some things that God does hate. Turn to Deuteronomy 16, uh, 22. Deuteronomy chapter 16, I want to just show four different verses that demonstrate that God does hate some things. Uh, Sometimes the idea is given out that God is love and there's no hate in him. God does not hate people. God loves all people, but God does hate certain things. So I think in, in beginning this message today, we need to understand that we ought to hate the things that God hates and that we ought to love the things that God loves. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 22 says this, Neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. God hates idolatry. These statues, these Satanistic statues and things that are going up across our country, now God absolutely hates that, and we ought to hate those statues. Now we live in a country, and they have the freedom to do that. Uh, We speak the truth, and the truth can change people and change people's hearts, uh, but that very idea that there is an idol that someone is bowing down to, we ought to have an aversion to that idol. We ought to hate idolatry and every form of idolatry. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible says this, These six things doth the Lord hate, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And so here's some things that God hates, a proud look. And we ought to hate a proud look, and therefore we ought to not have a proud look. There's some people walk around, their nose is in the air, they think they're better than everyone else. That is not belong in a Christian because God hates that. A lying tongue. Christians should hate lying. And, and deceit and all the things that go around with that. The Bible tells us not to do the work of the Lord deceitfully. Uh, it is a shame when Christian people are involved in something that God hates. God hates lying, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Any person that kills a person not worthy of death. Now, there's a time that capital punishment is necessary. If a person murders someone, if a person is a man-stealer, the Bible says, if a person is someone that uh, abuses someone or forces them in a physical manner, um, then the Bible has death penalty things for certain sins. And because God hates hands that shed innocent blood. You, You think about all the hands that shed the blood of innocent babies still in their mother's wombs. God hates those hands, and those people are going to stand before God someday. And the idea of killing an innocent, God hates that. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Well, we we are in a wicked society. It's getting more wicked all the time. How many of you have discovered that there are sins out there that 20 years ago you would not have thought existed? And those sins are, it's like, where'd that one come from? What in the world, where is that coming from? The more wicked a society gets, now now these sins are not new, but wicked imaginations are constantly bringing things up. God hates that. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. You know, that idea of I'm going to get involved in evil things again and again and quickly involved in those things. A false witness that speaketh lies. So lying is in there twice. But this one is is when you're perjury, you're uh, trying to witness against someone in order to get a punishment on them that they don't deserve. Let's just sit up just a little bit there. 
You pay, pay attention better if you're sitting up. Okay, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. When somebody comes in and they take, not, not just physical brothers, but, but spiritual brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ, and people try to divide people. God hates that division. So God does hate some things. Go to Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 15. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 15. So as Christian people, having the love of God in our hearts, there are some things that we should hate. In Zechariah 8, verse 17, it says, Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So when you plot against your neighbor or against someone, God says, I, I hate that. You know what that is? It is a lack of forgiveness. It is allowing bitterness to grow up in a person to the point that you will actually plot the demise of someone who is next to you. And then it says, love no false oath. The idea of making a promise and not keeping it. So God hates these things. Malachi chapter 2, just a couple pages over. Malachi chapter 2. Verse 16, verse 16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, and that is divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. And that whole passage talks about a man putting away his wife, and he says, it's a treacherous thing. I hate it when a man puts away his wife. So these are things that God hates. These are things that Christian people ought to hate. Uh, we ought to despise these things. They, we ought to have a great aversion to those things. But looking deeper, because when a person allows hate to manifest in, the, in their heart, how does that hate then affect a person? Let's go to Ecclesiastes and look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. We're going to several passages of Scripture today because we ultimately, we have to see what does the Bible say about the topic. Some people hate themselves or their very life. And I believe we are in a society right now where there are more people that hate themselves than significantly more than in the past, significantly more than when I was growing up. And what is causing that? Look at verse 17 and 18. It says, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Solomon got this spirit in him. He got so self-centered that he hated going to work and having to work in order to give to someone or something else. He became so self-centered that he was looking at the labor that he was putting in, and he's saying, man, you know, I've, I've put some of this up, and I'm going to die, and someone else is going to get all of this that I have stored up. Now, ought, that ought to be a blessing. You know, the Bible talks about a, a man that leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the Bible declares that that's a good thing. The idea of storing up and able to leave an inheritance. But what is that? That's love. You actually are working hard. And, and you know what? If you die before you get to spend it all, you get to leave it to somebody else. That ought to be a blessing. You ought to be able to look at that and say, hey, I get to do this. I get to leave something to, you know, I've got some children that love the Lord and are living for the Lord. I get to leave them something when I die. Boy, if you can do that, that's, that's a great thing. But Solomon had this self-centered attitude, and he had so much. Um, if, if, you, if you will look at chapter 2, and I'm just going to point out some phrases in verse 4, 5, and 6. I made me. I builded me. I planted me. 
I made me. I made pools. I got me servants. I had great possessions. I gathered me. I got me. So I was great. And when Solomon became that self-centered, he hated himself. And he hated his life. And any person that just gets focused on living for themselves and doesn't live for other people, they become a hateful person. They hate themselves ultimately. Sometimes people sin against someone and end up hating the person because they hate themselves. 2 Samuel 13. This is a tragic uh, history. It's not a story. It's a history. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Amnon had been influenced by his friend to do something very wicked to his sister. And he forced her. And in 2 Samuel 13, verse 15, it says this, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. Amnon sinned. Now here, Amnon didn't hate Tamar because of anything that had to do with Tamar. Amnon hated himself. He had sinned. He had forced his sister in this situation. He had sinned against her. The hatred that was there was a hatred toward himself. And every time he would see her from then on out, it would remind him of how wicked and ungodly he was. And ultimately, so many times, a person, when they hate themselves, they then take that hatred and deflect it on to other people. So some people, they do hate themselves then that hatred gets transferred and some people hate other people. Look at, uh, and we'll give several examples of this, Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And, and take this and remember, no one is immune from this happening and building in their own life. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, it says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing therewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Now ultimately, to begin with, Esau had sold his birthright. That was a very foolish thing, but he sold it. And there was a hatred there from that point on. Then he loses the blessing later on. And now he has this hatred build up, and this hatred makes him want to actually kill his brother. Genesis chapter 37. Truth for youth, there was a good message on the life of Joseph yesterday. Genesis 37, verses 4 through 8. It says, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, this dream, and, and again, this isn't a dream that Joseph made for himself. This is a dream that he had at night when God uh, showed him a dream and told him this is going to be the future. Now, we have the finished Word of God. God doesn't really work through dreams the same way that he used to. Okay, but he dreamed here a dream. He told the dream. He says, look, you're ultimately someday going to bow down before me. I'm going to be Lord over you. Now, that's probably not going to be popular with his brothers. I don't know that it was the wisest thing for him to go and tell them that dream. He could have kept that dream to himself. Maybe he could have shared it with his dad and said, you know, dad, I had this dream. Uh, but, but ultimately they hated him. Joseph's brothers hated him. What did that cause? Because we're looking, how does hate affect us? 
When we hate ourselves, it leads then to hating others. But then when we hate others, they were willing to kill, sell, and lie to their father about their brother. Just simply because there was a dream that he had and that they might someday have to bow before him. That he would someday be over them. And they despised that so much that they developed a hatred and they decided they were going to kill him. And then they decided, one of them decided, let's not kill him. Let's sell him to be a slave. and Let's lie to dad about it. And all of that stemmed from a hatred, the, the thought of somebody's above me, I'm not on top, I hate that person. You've seen it. When somebody can't be the, the, the top head person, and it takes place at the job, it takes place, you that are in school, do you see it in school sometimes? Somebody uh, maybe was the top sports player on the team and somebody else comes in and plays a little bit better than they do. And what happens? Almost a rivalry. Sometimes it goes to the level of hatred. Girls, it works a little differently sometimes. She's more popular than you are. And so all of a sudden there develops this hatred in your heart toward them. But we have to be careful what's going on in our heart, don't we? We have to be careful how our heart is affecting us. And it could be a co-worker. Uh, Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15. There was an expectation when Jacob died and Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery. It says in verse 15, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, peradventure, Joseph will or Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. See, their hatred led them to think that other people harbor the same hatred they harbor. Joseph had completely forgiven them. Joseph had completely understood that though they were the ones that sold him, it was God's plan and that God had blessed him and prospered him, and he had completely forgiven him. But they're still in the back of their mind, well, he's got to hate us. We hated him. He has to hate us. And so many times, people take what they're feeling on the inside, and they project it onto someone else, and that person isn't doing it at all. And they, they think, well, I hate, so they must hate. And, and you can take that with many attributes. Hate all too often spreads from its original target. Go to 2 Samuel 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Absalom hated his brother Amnon because of what Amnon had done to his sister. In 2 Samuel 13... Verse 22, the Bible says this, Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Verse 28, now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him, fear not. He hated his brother now, look, his brother did wrong. His brother should have been punished. I believe capital punishment should have been in order for that particular thing based upon the laws of the Bible prior to that. That did not happen. Really, there was no punishment that took place. And so Amnon allowed that because this person didn't get punished. He allowed his a hatred to build up in his heart. Now, when hatred builds up in your heart, whether you can look at it and say it's justified or not, who does that hatred harm? It harms you. Well, he decides to kill his brother Amnon, but it doesn't stop there. Hatred, so many times, uh, it spreads 
from its original target. Go to 2 Samuel 15, and we're going to see this hatred that Absalom has toward Amnon. Even after Amnon is dead, that hatred continues to spread, and he rebels against his father David and, and tries to take over the kingdom. Verse 2 through 6, Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man had a controversy, came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Oh, Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or might ca or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Look at verse 12 then. But Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Giloth, while he offered sacrifices and the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. They had to get out of there because Absalom, once he started with this idea of hate, it spread from the initial target to literally a whole lot of people. Jaden, sit up there, bud. It spread to a lot of people. And that, that, that spreading hate, look, a person can hate somebody at work. What happens when they come home? It starts spreading in the family. They start projecting that same hate because you can't keep it focused. Our flesh is not something that we look at and say, well, I can participate in a sin and keep that sin focused or keep that sin in control. I'll only do this sin occasionally. I I've got this. Look, anybody ever notice you start down a road of sin, it grows Sin is never satisfied. The flesh is never satisfied. You're never going to be able to stop. And you can take any sin and look at that, but you take this sin of hatred, you allow a little hatred in there, it's going to grow. And all of a sudden, you're going to be hating people that you have no reason to hate. You're going to be projecting that hate onto people that it's like, why do I hate that person? Well, you just start hating everybody. So hate spreads. When someone wants to do wrong, sometimes they hate the preacher. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22, we have a man named Ahab. Now, Ahab was a hateful man. A chapter before 1 Kings 22, Ahab was so full of hate that he hired false witnesses against Naboth because Naboth wouldn't sell him a vineyard. And he and Jezebel, Jezebel concocted most of that plan, but Ahab is literally, I'll kill somebody because I don't get my way. And then comes this man, Micah. Chapter 22, Israel, verse 8, The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, not Micah, it's Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I, what? I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. See, Ahab was a wicked man. Micaiah was a man who would tell him the truth. And, you know, he gets a bunch of false prophets. Oh, king, you're going to go into battle. You're going to win. Boy, with, you know, you're, you're just going to accomplish this thing. Everything's going to go great. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, is looking at this situation. He's saying, um, these are all prophets of Baal. Is there a prophet of the Lord here? And 
Well, yeah, there is one, but I hate him. I want to do evil, and he tells me it's wrong. I hate him. He, he, he doesn't prophesy good concerning me. He tells the truth. Boy, people love to have their ears tickled, don't they? Boy, you, you can look at some of the mega churches. They got the pastor with the big smile. It's like gl glued on. They would never talk about hell. Would never talk against sin. They would never say that God judges someone. Never say that God hates something. But, but we got to tell the truth. And so look at what happens to Micah, uh, verse 27. And say, thus saith the king, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I come in peace. Well, he was never going to come in peace. But he, he hated this man, so he throws him in prison simply because he speaks the truth. You know, you look at our society. You go out and speak the truth. People will absolutely hate you. They will absolutely hate you. So how do we overcome this thing? The idea, we understand hate. We can see what hate does. Some people hate themselves. Some people hate others. It always goes from one step to another step to another step. It spreads from its original target. How do you deal with it? Let's go to 1 John. 1 John. 1 John is written to born-again believers. 1 John deals heavily with what our inner man ought to be. And 1 John deals with people when they're not sure of their salvation. The book of 1 John is the book to go to. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15. First thing in dealing with this sin is, is we need to realize how bad this sin is. 1 John 3, verse 15, and it says this, Whosoever hateth his brother is a what? Well, that's a pretty strong word. I, I would never describe myself as being a murderer. Well, yeah, I hate this person. God says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. But this is written to people to help them to discern, am I a saved person or not? Saved people, hate does not belong in their heart toward other people. And especially when it's another saved brother, a fellow Christian. And so he says, you need to look at this thing. This is a serious sin. God describes it as murder. You can't leave that thing in your heart. We, I mean, we all would look at, I mean, how, how many of you, I mean, if you just looked at all the sins, how many of you think murder is, is like up at the top of the list? It's like, okay, that's the majority. And there, there may be some things worse than murder. Mur murder's up there. Hate in your heart is a mental murder of that person. When you have that much of an aversion, you ever hear somebody, I wish you were dead. Where'd that come from? Hate has built up in the heart. And so first, the first thing in dealing with this sin is realizing Hate is not something that you can just keep in there, and it's okay because it's just toward one person, and, you know, I'm just going to hang on to that. Now, hatred needs to be gone. Hatred needs to be confessed as sin and dealt with as sin and repented of and ask God to help you get that hatred out of your heart. Do you hate someone this morning? Ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to help you get that out of your heart. Hatred does not belong in the heart of a born-again Christian. And then realize what state it puts you in. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. Look at these verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. He that saith he is in the light 
and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because darkness hath blinded his eyes. You know what hatred does? Hatred makes you blind. You know, a person, you have hatred toward a person, you don't see any good in him. He's probably got some good in him, but you can't see any good in him. But it goes beyond that person. You are no longer walking in the light. You, you know, that hatred in your heart, that it does not go along with the Holy Spirit that's living in your heart. And you are no longer walking in light. You're walking in darkness. You're shutting out guidance from God. You're shutting out guidance from the Holy Spirit. And that hatred that's in you is going to cause your life to take turns, turns that should not, it should not take. You will make decisions that you would have never made if you were walking in the light. But because you're not walking in the light, you will make decisions and those decisions will be wrong decisions completely. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a what? So if you hate someone, don't tell me you love God because God says you're a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loveth God Love his brother also. There's no room in the heart for hatred. Now, look, there's times when you have to separate from a person because they did something wrong. But there's a difference between separating from a person because they did something wrong and hating a person. You should not hate anybody. And it puts you in a bad state. And you can no longer say you love God. If you have hatred in your heart. So what do we do? We repent and do good to them that hate you. Go to Luke 6. Luke chapter 6. And verse 27, 28. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. You got somebody that you have hatred towards? Pray for them. And try to do something good for them. Oh, I could never do anything good for that person. That's because you have hatred. What if God had decided to hate us for what we've done to God. H have we sinned against God? Has everybody here sinned against God? What if God decided to hate you because you sinned against him? I am glad, but God commendeth his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what God did? God did this. He took a person who hated him enough to sin against him, and he sent Jesus Christ to die for that person. God demonstrated this for us. So when God says, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, he is saying, do what I did. Do what I did. And we'll finish with Romans 12, 21. Romans 12, 21. The Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. There are people that their entire life has been destroyed because somebody did them wrong. And they let that eat on them from the inside out. And there's a hatred in them that lasted for years toward that person that affected the decisions that they made, that affected their relationship with God and man and family, and it allowed them to destroy it. That person is overcome of evil. Or there's a person that, you know, somebody did me wrong. I'm glad that I'm the one that got done wrong rather than I'm the one that did the wrong. How about that attitude? And we can look at it. Yeah, maybe they did you wrong. And maybe, you know what? If a person steals from you, I don't think I would 
put my car out there unlocked for them to steal it again. You don't have to do that. Well, that person borrowed money from me and never paid it back. I hate them. Well, who, who loaned the money? And the Bible has something to say about that, too. If you, if you loan it, it says, don't expect to get it back. You should loan it with the idea, the mentality that it's gone. If they give it back to you, great. But people can make a decision and they allow hatred to build up in their life. They become overcome of evil. And God says, no, stop. Overcome evil with good. Love the person anyway. Do right by the person anyway. We, you've used, heard the phrase, kill them with kindness. Okay, you're not actually killing them. You're be kind to them. And, and you know what? They may see that and they may repent. And then you've gained a brother. See, if, if, if you have hatred in your heart, you need to have a conversation. First of all, with God, you need to confess your sin. Now, if that person doesn't have any idea that you hate them, you don't need to go tell them, I hated you and I want you to forgive me. That's probably not necessary. But if they did you wrong and that's eating on you, well, you need to talk to them. If there is a bitterness in you toward a person that is causing a break in fellowship, you need to talk to that person. The goal is get it right. Get it right. Now, if you talk to them and they don't change anything, there's not a lot you can do with it. That relationship may be severed, but let it be their problem, not yours. You just keep loving people, keep loving God, don't allow hate to build up in your heart. Now, we need God's help with this. We're human people. And there may be people, I don't know, there may be people in this room right now that have hated someone in the past and you got over it. Maybe there's somebody here right now that you hate somebody. You need to talk to God about that. Hate toward people is not godlike. It's sinful. Now, there are things to hate. But ultimately, every single person needs the gospel. I, I absolutely hate what's going on with to, to the children in our country. This sodomite agenda that gets forced on people. But Jesus Christ died for those people. They need to be saved. And you can you can commend love toward the people by giving them the gospel. You don't have to agree. And, and this idea that goes out there of you have to agree with everybody's sin to show love to them. No, you don't. You tell them they need to repent. Let them know they're on their way to hell. They're, look, if they don't see punishment for sin, they, they aren't going to repent. But don't get joy out of, ah, you're going to die and go to hell. You're a wicked sinner. Look, you shouldn't get joy out of that. It should break your heart. We need to check our hearts, just make sure we're on the inside. We're right with God dealing with these things. Let's stand to our feet. To give an invitation at this time, but Father, I, I ask you would just work in our hearts. God, help us to be loving people. God, help us to love you. God, help us to love the brethren. God, help us to love the sinner that needs to be saved. God, I pray maybe there's someone here that you're working in their heart. God, I pray to you, just help them to deal with it. God, because we, we can't do this on our own. Hate is not something that's easily gotten over. God, we need your help for it. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen. As the piano plays, you have something to come and pray about. I'd encourage you to come. Maybe there's somebody you need to come and pray for. Somebody you need to come and forgive. Maybe after service is over, somebody needs to go and talk to somebody and get some things worked out. Maybe you're here today and you hate yourself. That's not good either. There's no room for hatred where the Holy Spirit of God lives. We were hateful. Now we're not. Lives changed. The spirit of meekness overcomes the spirit of hate. I trust that you have a good week. Come back tonight. We've got a message tonight, another message for my son tonight. My son and everybody else's son. Okay, but, um, and, and then we have the children's quiz at the beginning of the service tonight as well. And at the end of the service, we'll be voting on uh, the help to a couple pastors. So, Father, we are grateful for your word. And, uh, your word has all the answers. We don't have to, a person doesn't have to go to a psychiatrist or psychologist and try to figure this out. God, we have uh, a, a loving God with a Holy Spirit that dwells within us with a word of God that helps us and teaches us how to deal with uh, our inner selves. God, I pray that you would help us to walk right with you. God, help us to have a walking, living relationship with you day by day. God, help us not just to get up in the morning and, and be on our way without talking to you. God, help us throughout the day to have fellowship with you. God, we need this. We need to walk with you. God, fill us with your love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.